Hello, welcome again to another edition of Matters of the Heart, brought to you by Haverhill Community Television and Pentucket Medical Cardiology. I'm Seth Bilizarian, a cardiologist with PMA, and I'm with my usual guest and host, uh, co-host, Dr. Sunny Srivastava. We're uh, doing a program today. Dr. Srivastava is uh, taking a history of medicine approach here and talking about milestones in cardiology. Based on a recent article in the European Journal of Cardiology, he's reviewing some really great information over the years, uh, over centuries, of how we've gotten here in the treatment of patients with heart disease. So I'll just turn it over to you, Dr. Srivastava. Yeah. Tell us what we know. Well, thank you. It, um, it's actually, a, I find it very interesting because one thing, I was actually a history major in college, so I find history very interesting a, a, in general, but um, it is, to me, fascinating to see where we've come from um, and especially how accelerated the progress has been over the last, not even just five years, 10 years, um, just even the last one year, things just keep accelerating almost in an exponential fashion. And, and to go way back, to start way back in the beginning, the, uh, the conception of modern cardiology, you can go back thousands of years BC, uh, ancient China or ancient Greece, where they made the observation or had the feeling that blood flowed in a, conti a continuous current, uh, a circulation, um, but couldn't really describe it much more than that. But really, the, the first time where that type of um, thought was uh, well described in the mid-1600s by a very famous scientist named William Harvey, uh, in 1628 published some of his experience where he, for the first time really, describe the circulation and the function of the heart as a pump. Um, and, 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 you know, that much earlier than I would have probably realized, 1628. Um, as far as getting into cardiology, into medicine, things maybe 100 years later um, started to uh, come to life where there, the first real description of angina or chest pain coming from the heart, from blockage in the arteries of the heart. That was actually in the first issue of the New England Journal of Medicine in the late 1700s. Um, shortly thereafter, uh, in the later 1700s, um, I think it was a German physician, and I'm looking for the name, actually a British physician, I'm sorry, Withering, um, described the use of a plant or herb called foxglove, which we all now know as digitalis or digoxin, but first described its use for the treatment of lower extremity swelling, uh, they called dropsy, um, and uh, how it could strengthen uh, a weakening heart. Uh, and that was in 1785, and it's a medication that we use quite frequently now uh, by the name of digoxin. Um, shortly thereafter, another therapy was described, um, amyl nitrate, or a, a nitroglycerin type of product used for the treatment of angina. But things really halted at that point in the late 1700s and not much changed or progressed with regards to medications or innovations until 1819, uh, which I think this innovation probably uh, changed a ton, uh, changed so much. And that was the invention of the steth stethoscope by a French professor named Lanec, uh, 1819. Uh, and not only did that aid and accelerate the field of cardiology, but also other fields in medicine as well. So Lenec in 1819 came up with the stethoscope. Yeah, one of the things that I remember hearing about the invention of stethoscope that I, I'm sure that you have heard as well is that one of the great challenges was we, we lived in a more modest time and it was very problematic to listen to a woman's chest. A, a physician would have to put his ear actually on a woman's chest and that was very problematic. So mm -hmm. one of the problems that Lenec's stethoscope solved was the ability to listen but be a little bit away from the chest. So yeah. that was one of the challenges that we probably wouldn't face today in, right. in, in our current state of modesty. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and so now as you move forward to the turn of the 20th century, uh, histo or, uh, medical historians largely point to three major innovations that really um, accelerated uh, our, our progress and really gave birth to, the, uh, to modern cardiology. The first one is in 1895, and this uh, discovery or innovation isn't just cardiac in nature, but that was the discovery of the diagnostic x-ray by Wilhelm Rentgen in Germany. So it's 1895. He was a German physicist, went on to win the Nobel Prize uh, for that work. Um, and from a cardiology standpoint, the chest x-ray would give us a great deal of information that people were very interested in seeing the size of the heart, the shape of the heart, um, calcification. Later. X-ray moved into fluoroscopy where you see motion and movement of the heart as well. So 1895, the invention of the X-ray was really a, um, 
uh, a monumental moment in, in, in modern cardiology. Number two was the development of a practical, practical non-invasive way of measuring blood pressure. And it was two different things. There was an Italian uh, scientist named Rochi uh, in 1896 who came up with the blood pressure cuff, and there was a Russian named Korotkov uh, shortly thereafter, maybe eight, nine years later, who figured out how to listen for blood pressure and what we all do even today when we're taking a blood pressure, um, putting a stethoscope right over here and listening. Um, those are called Karatkov sounds uh, in, in his honor, uh, certainly. Uh, and so that was another major innovation and, um, in, in cardiology and just general medicine in, in general. Uh, and the third thing was actually the development of the electrocardiogram by uh, a scientist named Eindhoven, also in Germany. Uh, in 1901, 1902, somewhere in the early 1900s, um, which is a mainstay of our practice. It gives us a wealth of information with regards to cardiac function, arrhythmia, um, uh, diagnosis of heart attack, um, a tremendous innovation that um, we use daily and probably take for granted, but uh, um, was a, uh, the third of the three big hallmark innovations in the turn of the 20th century that uh, medical historians still point to. What an amazing uh, thing, you because I didn't know this until you were sharing it with me. So from 1895 to 1902, in a seven-year period, X-ray, yeah. EKG, and blood pressure measurement. Yeah. Just in seven years, three of the things that we still use yeah. largely today. So and, Pretty amazing. Know, over 100 years ago. So yeah, very neat. Um, and, and shortly thereafter, again, still in the early 1900s, really seemed to be a golden era of um, innovation, discovery, experimentation. Um, there was a um, animal models being performed showing that if you tie off a coronary artery uh, in a dog, for example, that it would rapidly lead to death. Uh, and so it was thought that this is what's happening with um, humans when they die suddenly from what they thought was a heart attack, that the artery is being suddenly blocked off. Shortly thereafter, a, a, a physician from Vienna, uh, Krell is the name, made the observation that one could have blockage in the artery but it not lead to fatality, not lead to death. Um, that you could have chest pain and heart attack, but it was not uniformly fatal. Um, in 1910 was the first real description in the medical literature of a myocardial infarction. That's the medical term for heart attack. Uh, that was in Russia, in Kiev. Um, and they thought that the usual precipitant was exertion or emotional stress, which are precipitants that we point to you know, now, 100 plus years later. Um, and shortly thereafter, Herrick uh, described the actual electrocardio electrocardiographic findings of a heart attack. Um, again, this is all in the early 1900s. And it seems like modern cardiology had its birth in Europe for the most part. All these innovations and scientists and things are happening in Europe and things spread rapidly. But without a doubt, the birth of modern cardiology um, took place in Europe. Uh, and simultaneously, there was a lot of work being done on a biochemical level or biochemistry level looking at things and pathology. Um, there were, again, German chemists who were describing the presence of cholesterol and, uh, and plaque. Um, and shortly thereafter, in 1913, and this is still often referred to, um, these two Russians, two young Russian scientists, really, I think, described for the first time the lipid theory of atherogenesis, the lipid theory of um, plaque production uh, with their experiments where they fed a uh, large quantity of cholesterol to rabbits and drove their cholesterol up over a thousand and then later on discovered the lipid plaque buildup in their aorta and other arteries. Uh, and so that really gave birth to this thought that diet, cholesterol, leads to plaque, leads to bad things. I and mean, that was you know exactly a hundred years ago basically. Um, yes, 1913, so a hundred years ago uh, where they came up with that. Um, and it's been the the focus of a lot of our therapies and a lot of our preventative efforts based on that initial lipid model. Um, also in this time, uh, not just on the bench side of science and the research side of science or the, um, the lab coming up with innovations, doctors all around the world were starting to unite and do different things that created medical journals so they could share their discoveries, uh, which we take for granted. It's a very swift and quick thing now when someone publishes a study, it gets disseminated quickly. Um, the first cardiology journal was in 1908 in France, shortly thereafter in Germany. The first English journal was in 1909 called Heart, that still exists today um, in Great Britain. And um, 
more and more came down the pike later, and then there were international cardiology journals coming out later in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, simultaneously with these journals coming out, uh, societies started to develop. Also getting these scientists together to discuss their findings, and I think it really helped accelerate progress. And so the British Cardiac Club, which later became the British Cardiac Society in the early to mid-1900s, the American Heart Association, which we all refer to, the AHA, was born in 1924. Another large cardiologist society, the American College of Cardiology, uh, was started in 1949. These two societies, the AHA and ACC, uh, American College of Cardiology, are vital in um, giving us guidelines on how to treat certain different, uh, different conditions um, and setting up uh, scientific meetings where physicians can share what they've learned. Um, and so that's been a, a, a tremendous development. Um, the need for support and research became more of a focus um, on the government side of things as well, in addition to just the university or academic side of things. Um, the NHLBI was established in 1948. They are a, uh, what, the National Heart, Lung, Blood Institute. Um, it was called something else to begin with. Um, NIH, these are big, society, uh, uh, big organizations funding research. And later is when um, the pharmaceutical industry or biotech industry or mechanical device industry got involved too with promoting and paying for research as well. Um, so those are sort of the early years of what got us going into the early to mid 1900s. Um, but a lot of, I, 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 looking at this article and looking at this stuff, the early 1900s seemed like a really robust, active period of time. So you told us about those seven years that I described where we got EKG, X-ray, and blood pressure measurement. Mm -hmm. So how do we get to the f newer things like catheterization? When did those come yeah. about? So catheterization, it's, it's a pretty interesting story and pretty bold story. Um, and uh, in 1929, I, uh, I actually a urologist, a resident in urologic surgery in Germany, I believe, um, named Werner Forsman, uh, was the first one to perform a catheterization. Um, and he performed it on himself, which was quite amazing. And what he was looking to do was to come up with a way of delivering medications directly to the heart. Now, as we were just sitting down here, you started to tell me a little anecdote about this. Maybe you can, you might be able to tell it better than I well, can. Well, I heard the story that you know, this was something that, you know, there was, it was in an era where there was probably less supervision, so he was able to do this, but that he needed a witness and that he, the story uh, is told that he uh, had a, a woman friend who was a nurse in the hospital and he got her to agree to have this done on her and his intention was to have her witness this, but he tricked her and had her on the x-ray table, tied her down, and then he did it to himself so she would witness this procedure. So he threaded the catheter from his arm into his heart and then took an x-ray picture of it inside his heart. So that was the first heart catheterization yeah. from a person. So he didn't heed that warning, don't try this at home alone, no, folks. That's the, and the story, I think, continues where when his chief caught wind of this, obviously forbid him from doing it and forbid him from doing it on anybody else, and it actually kind of halted the progress of the technique um, because it froze right there and stopped right there for a while. Uh, and, and so we, m many first point to the first cardiac catheterization being done uh, as research and also as a diagnostic tool in the early 1940s at, um, at uh, Bellevue Hospital in New York, Columbia University. As, as the, and then shortly thereafter, a couple of docs really embraced the technique to measure and document the what we call hemodynamics of various cardiac conditions and at this point what the cardiac catheterization was really doing was measuring pressures in different chambers of the heart and waveforms they weren't so much doing what we talk about now what's called angiography in in injecting dye directly into the arteries that came later um, but but the uh, the catheterization it was a, a real um, uh, major innovation in, in, in cardiology and allowed us to learn so much more about these conditions and how to, what you see and how to treat them. Um, and it's spawned so many other techniques down the road, um, things that we do all the time now. Obviously, and we'll talk further about this angioplasty, stents. Um, a lot of electrophysiologic procedures come from, are born from this, where catheter-based procedures go up to the heart and can perform ablations to get rid of arrhythmias. Um, it's even gone to the point now where there are catheter-based approaches to replace or fix heart valves. Uh, and we've talked about that before in other episodes of the show. So the cardiac catheterization really gave birth to a lot of things. So you made mention that this German urology resident, uh, Forsman, put a catheter into his heart. 
Um, but when was the first time when they actually took pictures of the heart arteries like we do now, where we do a heart catheterization to check a patient's heart blockages? When was that? Yeah, done? so angiography is what we call that, when you inject dye and it fills the arteries and you can map out the blockages and map out the arterial tree. Um, it's my recollection to understand that was really first developed in Cleveland in 1958 by a physician named Sones. Uh, so 1958. So less than 50 years ago. Yeah, less than 50 years ago. That's not where it, you couldn't do stents or a little, two th more. Well, sorry, yeah. my, my mistake. Yeah, um, less than 60 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> less than 100 years ago, <laughs> you can say. Yeah. Uh, but no, it, um, at that point, it was really a diagnostic tool, really critical to aid, down the road to aid folks in planning for coronary artery bypass surgery. Um, I think Grunzig was the one who, uh, who helped develop that, and actually Grunzig in 1977 was the first person to perform an angioplasty as well, where at the tip of one of these catheters, there's a little balloon, and I think many of the audience will know what this is, but the balloon inflates and, I guess, for lack of a better, you know, smushes the blockage into the walls of the, the artery. So that's 1977 by Grunzig, uh, was the first person to perform an angioplasty. Stents as we know it, came down the road. Uh, actually, not that much later, to be honest with you. The first stent, and you might know better than me, given your background, I think the first stent, 1986 in France, more of an experimental thing, not FDA approved until, what, 1993, 94? Exactly, 1993 was the first US stent. Yeah, so it took a little bit of time for that, certainly, but things started to move more rapidly at this point, and, and um, were interesting. And so, when talking, you know, this gives me a natural launching off point to talk about heart attack and where we've come, and we can talk about different conditions now and how we've evolved. You know, we've talked about some of the procedures and the techniques, but maybe we'll talk about conditions. And so heart attack, back in 1912, Herrick, who I mentioned before, who described the EKG findings, so 101 years ago, he stated that there was an absolute importance for bed rest with a heart attack. Bed rest, bed rest, bed rest. That's a cornerstone of therapy. There wasn't really much else other than digitalis or digoxin. Um, and that's all they recommended. So and just for the audience, just to, for fun to talk about. Yeah. So at this point in time where you're describing, the early 1900s, but really almost up to the 1960s, there's a, a, a thinking that something bad's happened to the heart. Maybe there's a blockage based on animal studies, but people really don't know what to do about it, how to do it. We just know that the heart has sort of taken a hit, I think is what, what's the state yeah. of the art, and just rest. That's pretty much the state of the art. I can remember as a medical student, I'm older than you, yeah. where patients would be in the hospital for several weeks, they were strongly recommended not to brush their hair because the fear was that if they just raised their hand to brush their hair, it was too stressful on the heart. So the idea was just to really put things at rest and have the patient rest and recover for periods of time. And, and I know you can get to this, but the amazing thing is now we take the worst heart attacks and people go home in two nights. And that's right. sort of back to work in a few weeks kind of thing. So it's yeah, really amazing. Yeah, and, and you know, exactly that. What they, you know, it started to become more and more clear that a heart attack was, wasn't a rare thing. Um, it was actually pretty quickly figured out that it was actually the most common cause of death in the industrialized world. Um, but what they were finding out quickly too is that this, this therapy of stay in bed, decrease your fluids, do nothing, wasn't working. It was actually causing problems with blood clots in the legs, blood clots going to the heart, um, to the lungs. People were dying as a result. Um, so practice gradually changed, but it sounds, you know, even when you're starting off as a, as a medical student, it still hadn't changed much until, you know, my impression was, and maybe you can correct me, was you know, 1980s, 1970s, 1980s, um, yeah. when it started to change where um, people figured out that you don't do well just laying there with nothing uh, and there's other things to do. And what really helped advance the um, improved outcomes in heart attack was the advent of what's called a CCU, a coronary care unit. It is largely pointed to as one of the most, um, the singular advances in the treatment of heart attack, the singular best advance in the treatment of heart attack. It was proposed in 1961 as a, um, in Scotland, I believe, where it was thought that having a specialized location and center within the hospital um, would allow for aggregating all the patients in one area where trained personnel, equipment, drugs were all there, right in one spot. Um, you could have continuous, continuous monitoring of the EKG, and now we can have that in lots of places in a hospital. Back then, that was not the case. Um, actually learned closed chest resuscitation, or CPR, um, and the actually the ability of nurses to deliver that care instead of a physician who might not be there was a huge benefit as well um, because before only the physician could do these things and often people would have to wait uh, but as the at CCU became more um, prevalent other staff aside from the physician or attending physician were trained to do these things um, and, and so that was a big big change 
Um, this spread like wildfire everywhere very quickly. And with that also came a drop in the early mortality rates after a heart attack from 30% down to 15% quite quickly, just with the advent of the CCU. So just for our audience, just to chiefly say, we know that after a heart attack, one of the dangerous things is the heart has a bad, irregular heart rhythm and can just, the heart can ultimately just stop. So by using that electrical shock people have seen on TV or doing CPR, people can be recovered right. from that. But of course, if someone is in a place that you don't know, they're in a hospital bed and they're not being monitored, the nurse won't find them until hours right. later, and then unfortunately they can't be resuscitated. So by having these people all together where they're being watched and monitored, just that advance of being able to shock them quickly made a huge difference. Made a huge difference, and then before that, where I think what would happen is the nurse would see what's going on and have to call the physician and wait. Now, you know, no one does that. The nurse is trained and to take over and, and take care of the situation promptly. Um, so yeah, tremendous uh, uh, advances just with the coronary care units. Um, some other things came along with the for the treatment of heart attack. In the early 1970s, um, some Soviet cardiologists looked at the direct injection of what we call thrombolytics or clot busters into the coronary artery uh, for a treatment of a heart attack. So you have a heart attack because you have a narrowing, and then on top of the narrowing is this clot, mm -hmm. and that blocks up the blood flow to cause the heart attack. So these guys said if we inject this clot-busting medicine, we'll at least open up the clot and mm -hmm. allow blood to return. Yep. So that's the idea that they were doing. Yeah, and they, their goal was to limit the size of the heart attack and treat things. Um, and later in the late 1970s, 1979, 1980, maybe 81, um, came a, a pretty good advance of giving that therapy intravenously. So in an emergency room with a regular old IV, not injecting directly into the heart, intravenous clot buster medications. And for a long time, I think that was, uh, in, when I started practicing, there were other advances that, I didn't really do this very much, but I, I would imagine you quite a bit were right. involved with this. So maybe yes. you can talk a little bit well, about this. So there were several years there where we had these clot busting medicines. They, thin, they didn't just thin the blood, they actually break up clots. Mm -hmm. So they had a huge advantage of opening up blood flow and saving heart muscle. They had a really important impact of lowering the heart attack rate from 15 to 20% down to 5 to 10%. But they came at a significant cost of bleeding, and one of the big worries was bleeding in the brain. So for several years, there was small improvements in different drugs. We went from one drug called streptokinase to one called TPA. And the big improvements there were that was there was less bleeding in the brain. But that's what we were left with. But it was a huge advance, but mm -hmm. it was a disadvantage compared to what we do now. Yeah, and so down the road, and I think I alluded to later, um, in what is the current state of care is a direct you know, uh, coronary angiography, angioplasty stent. I think I highlighted the dates of... You know, the mid-1980s, 1986 was the first stent, but the FDA not approving it until 93 or 94. Uh, but now that is the mainstay of therapy for heart attacks or these acute heart attacks where the artery is thought to be 100% blocked up. Get, and there's mechanisms and systems in place to really accelerate, and even locally in our community, um, systems in place to, as rapidly as possible, get folks into the cardiac cath lab um, to get the procedure done, open up the artery, and get back blood flow. Right. So the advance there is that the clot busting medicines worked like 75 to 80 percent of the time, which is good. Yeah. The angioplasty works 99 percent of the time, but the biggest advantage also is there's almost no strokes with the angioplasty. So that's the right. big difference. Yeah, and, and, and you know, even just in my time and being in practice uh, here, the one innovation to add to this is that um, before, a lot of these procedures could only be done down in Boston or further away, the bigger hospitals. And patients would wait a long time sometimes to get their procedure done, and much to their detriment sometimes, where their heart attack would be worse, that their heart muscles dance. And now we can do it very quickly, promptly in the smaller, you know, more local hospitals. And it's been a major, I think, innovation as well, the ability to do that. Um, We've been talking mostly about heart arteries, heart bypass, heart blockages, that kind of stuff. Do you, t I know that there's some people in our audience who have pacemakers. Tell us a little bit about yeah. that story. So again, that's another, you know, a lot of now, you know, a lot of this stuff shifts to America, uh, where things are, you know, the birth of cardiology is Europe. Um, you know, we, we, we know about pacemakers. Pacemakers are put in when your heart rate's going too slow uh, for a variety of reasons. And the uh, first external pacemaker where maybe, you know, put from the outside, it can pace through the skin and the bone and tissue, was developed by somebody named Zoll in Boston in 1952. The implanted pacemaker was developed in Sweden in 1958. Um, and then quickly thereafter, a lot of other innovations came for other types of arrhythmias. If there's something called ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia, an external shock delivered with paddles like you see on TV, that was developed. 
Um, and then down the road, implantable defibrillators for certain people who have certain heart conditions where they're prone to fatal arrhythmias. So just like a pacemaker, but it has the ability to also deliver shock to the heart. Even further now, they've developed um, uh, special types of defibrillators that can help people with congestive heart failure and advanced congestive heart failure, help them improve their outcomes and symptoms. So really neat. Um, you know, I think we're running short of time. There, there's things with the val heart valves where um, innovations now, again, mostly spawned from the catheter-based techniques, but now, and I think we've talked about this in other shows, there is the ability to perform valve um, repair replacements with um, a catheter-based procedure. Uh, more studies are being done on that, but that is a tremendous um, advance. And in the field of congestive heart failure, I think there's been a lot of advance of late as well. And this is probably where you've seen a lot of change in your career as well. Um, looking way back into the 18th century when it was first recognized, the only thing really was rest and digitalis, nothing else. Um, the prognosis was pretty dismal. Um, we've come a long way with a lot of what's you know, good studies, um, diuretics, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, um, spironol, lots of medications here. Um, that even in thinking your time has changed quite a bit where for a while people never wanted to give beta blockers uh, in heart failure, now it's a standard of care. Um, and a lot of this comes through the development of really good, rigid, um, clinical trials. That's another thing in cardiology. I think that's probably been one of the leaders in medicine. Um, good, what we call randomized clinical trial, control trials, looking at therapies and really um, uh, uh, astutely seeing whether something's beneficial or not. And the one last thing I'll point to is that as an example of the need for these trials, uh, there was a trial called the CAST trial or study where it was thought that giving these antiarrhythmic drugs to patients after a heart attack because they have all these extra beats, they want to suppress them. It was thought that of course, given logically. These, yeah, logically, if you give these medicines to suppress those, people will do better. And in fact, when you finally subjected it to a rigorous scientific study, it was just the opposite. These people did worse, they died more. And so what may seem obvious is not always obvious, and the advent of the uh, randomized controlled trial is a very important uh, thing in cardiology. Um, and we could go on and on and on talking about the present and the future. Um, I'll just say this about the future, things could be very different. You know, the, the author of this article, Eugene Brunwald, who's a famous cardiologist, um, he postulates that the, mod or the future cardiologist may be somebody who is really looking at genetic analyses of patients and trying to tailor their prevention by, based on their um, genomic studies and such, and that we may be sitting down with patients with all their genomic information and talking about what therapies might, they might be, and he may be right, um, but that's, uh, that's wow. for the future. What a fantastic review of the history of cardiovascular medicine by Dr. Srivastava. Uh, summarizing uh, several hundred years, several centuries of cardiovascular medicine, and they did a great job uh, helping us understand how far we've come and what the future might look like. So thanks to him for, for bringing us up to date on this exciting topic that we love and like to know the history of. And until next time, I'm Seth Belazarian with Pentucket Medical. Thank you for joining us. Good night.